Good morning, everyone, and welcome to session 5.3 here in virtual room two, where we'll be discovering It's Alive, why soil is the most important habitat you've never thought about. Thank you for tuning in from wherever you are to follow this virtual EU Green Week conference, heralding a new beginning for people and nature. If you didn't follow the sessions I moderated yesterday, a quick introduction. I'm Aminda Lee, a British Italian journalist and moderator specialising in environmental topics. And today I'm logged in from Rome, where the weather is a bit cloudy, but with some sunshine. I'm honoured to be your moderator for this session at Green Week. I'll explain how the next hour will be structured in a moment. But first, I have a few practical announcements. You can send in questions to the speakers by pressing on the big question mark button on the bottom right hand corner of your screen. For this session, there is interpretation available from Italian to English, as one of our speakers will be presenting and talking in Italian. Just click on the small round flag at the bottom right hand side of the screen, displaying the session video and slides to access the language that you'll need. To exchange messages with other people watching this session, please click on the join chat option on the left hand side of the display free screen I just mentioned. And of course, please do share your thoughts in the usual way via Twitter using the hashtag EU Green Week. Before I introduce you to the speakers, let's start getting down in the dirt and thinking about some soil. And to set the scene, I'd like to show you this short video. Did you know that without healthy soils, there would be no food on your table? That many textiles wouldn't exist? And that there wouldn't even be any wood? If we didn't have healthy soils that filter water, there would be more floods, more droughts, more carbon in the atmosphere. And definitively, less life. In fact, about 25% of European land is affected by water erosion, and the costs associated with soil degradation in the EU may exceed 50 billion euros per year. Without healthy soils, our planet would look very different. We have to make changes. We have to act now. It's our mission to heal the Earth together. Healthy soils, healthy planet, healthy people. Caring for soil is caring about life. So you can understand from all the images that we saw um, that how soil is important to our life, for our food, for our clothes, for wood, for our buildings. It is a very, very important aspect of our lives that we often overlook. Um, so here to talk to us about all things soil, we have four expert speakers who will share their knowledge with you today. Uh, please switch on your microphone and say hello when I've said your name and title. We're joined by Ronald Vargas, Land Resources Officer and Secretary of Global Soil Partnership at the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO. Good morning. We have Carlo Petrini, who is founder and president of Slow Food. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. We have Alfred Grant, who is organic farmer and board member of the EU Mission on Soil Health and Food. Hello from Austria. And we have Carlos Gerhard, uh, who is co-lead of the Global Soil Biodiversity Observation Network. Good morning. We'll be hearing more from them all in a moment. As we saw, didn't hear, but as we saw in the video, there is much more to soil than meets the eye. And as our session title says, it's the most important habitat you've never thought about. Soil is a living organism with more than 10 billion living microorganisms present in just a handful of the stuff. Can you believe that? 
a handful of soil contains more microorganisms like bacteria, insects, spiders, worms, and so on, than there are human beings on the planet. Healthy soils are key to achieve the objectives of the European Green Deal, such as climate neutrality, zero pollution, sustainable food systems, and a healthy, resilient environment. But soil is also increasingly degraded by the unsustainable way in which we're managing our land. What can be done to reverse this trend? Over the next hour, there will be plenty of opportunity for you to ask our speakers questions via the question mark button. After we've heard from the first two speakers, there will be time for your questions for them. After that, we'll hear from the second two speakers and there will be a bit more time for questions to them and the other panelists too. So let's start with our first speaker, Ronald Vargas from FAO, who's been Secretary of the Global Soil Partnership since it was formed in 2012. He's a soil scientist and has long experience working in sustainable soil management for food security and ecosystem services. As you can imagine, he's also heavily involved in World Soil Day, which is coming up on the 6th of December. This morning, he's going to give us a global perspective, exploring, among other things, why we need to protect soil biodiversity, how much we need to actually know about soil, and what is next for the future of our soil. Ronald Vargas, the virtual floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Aminda. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I think it's very important and I'm really uh, grateful for that. Today I will speak about why we need to protect soil biodiversity and I will try to, to convince you about that using some uh, outcomes of this report, which is the state of knowledge of soil biodiversity, status, challenges and potentialities that will be launched during the World Soil Day, which is 5th of December, but because of it's a Saturday, we will organize a, a meeting on the 4th of December. This is a joint outcome of many soil scientists around the world and, of course, many institutions that you can see there. Very importantly, you already mentioned, and we saw it in the video, uh, a healthy soil can be our ally because it's capable to providing many and most of the terrestrial ecosystem services that our life depends on and directly can contribute to achieve the sustainable development goals, human well-being, and of course, in the case of the European Union, the ambitious European Green Deal. But what is soil biodiversity? You already explained it that uh, talking about a handful of soil has many microorganisms, etc. And that's true. Soil biodiversity is the variety of life that we have below ground. When talking about biodiversity, we are used about above ground biodiversity and we can see it. But the one below, we rarely see it. And that's why it's quite challenging to show people that there is a huge life under our feet from microbes, mesofauna, macrofauna, till megafauna. And of course, they perform different ecological complex processes that are responsible for many of the things we enjoy in life. But what do we know about soil biodiversity? Well, if compared to the global biodiversity, we estimate that 25% belongs to soil biodiversity. And as you can see, we have from bacteria to ants, fungi, nematodes, etc. And we have um, researchers have been studying a lot. But uh, still, we can see that we just know one to two percent of this biodiversity. Although you can see here millions of species of fungi or nematodes, etc. But still, we don't know much about it. And that's of course very important to notice because up to 90% of all the living organisms in terrestrial ecosystems are associated in one part of their lives or cycles in below ground habitats. So there's quite a lot of this being the soil, their uh, site for living. It means that soil contains most of our diverse terrestrial communities 
in the world. And something very important here, we need to understand that both above and below ground are connected. We cannot disconnect them because they are very much interlinked. And why soil biodiversity is important? Well, we said the, that the provision soils provide may multiple ecosystem services. Most of these services are thanks to the soil biodiversity because they, they form part of a vast food web, okay? So we rely on the provision of ecosystem services thanks to soil biodiversity, those soil organisms. And there, each of these organisms play a specific role. Some are transforming organic and inorganic compounds. Some others are accelerating the composition and some others are the ecosystem engineers. So everyone has a role to play. And if we go into a specific topics, we will see that soil biodiversity is important, very crucial for improving agricultural production, for instance, because while what we want to avoid is to keep increasing the amount of agro inputs, but then we have an alternative because soil biodiversity can help us to avoid and reduce this and produce with uh, less, um, let's say, carbon footprint. When we talk about biological control, that we have clear examples on how we can use soil biodiversity in order to address pests and diseases in our crops. But also we use it very strongly in bioremediation and in soil rehabilitation strategies. Therefore, soil biodiversity can help us to bring back our soils alive and healthy. But there is an issue because currently soil biodiversity is threatened by many anthropogenic activities, mainly due to human actions. We are talking about deforestation, the agriculture intensification, anthropic nutrient imbalance, salinization, pollution, acidification, compaction, fire, which is very common nowadays, erosion and landslides, urbanization, surface sealing, and of course, loss of soil organic carbon and soil organic matter. All that are threatening our soil biodiversity, but what are the gaps that we found in this report? Uh, globally, there is lack of data and information, and this can sound, ah, it's always the same uh, complaint by scientists that they want to invest more in data and information. Yes, how can we manage something that we don't know? We, I explained to you that we know a bit, but we don't know everything. And if we want to really make use of soil biodiversity and healthy soils, we need to invest on proper data and information that is of course harmonized under global protocols because otherwise we are really missing something. And especially when, talk, when the soil survey is implemented, we are not really collecting soil biodiversity data. So we need to really include soil biodiversity into all this. And not only about focusing in microbes or microorganisms, we need to take the whole picture. Very importantly, one of the gaps is that we need to make soil biodiversity recognized in the 2030 agenda and in the post 2020 biodiversity agenda. I'm glad that in the, in the European Green Deal, this is very well recognized. Capacity development is still weak. We need to invest on training all institutions, countries, so that they can see soil biodiversity as an opportunity for addressing problems. When addressing ecosystem restoration, still we are not talking about soil health and neither soil biodiversity. Now microbi the microbiome became very important. So there are some investigations going on, but we need to move forward with this because we can see the relation between soils, environment, and human health. Research is important, but especially when talking about soil-borne diseases, because we see we, every time we are facing more challenges there, and our answer is to apply pesticides, herbicides, etc. So we need to open a door for an alternative. We need to scale up also the bioremediation when addressing soil pollution, because that is something that has a lot of potential. Potentialities, there are many. 
not only for food security with the improvement of agriculture production, and there we have uh, plenty of examples, but the biological control of pests of diseases, environmental remediation, when talking about climate change mitigation, adaptation, of course, carbon sequestration is fundamental, and that's due to the life we have beneath. Nature-based solutions that people talk about. Here we have a lot to offer, and of course, nutrition and human health is crucial, because as you know, many of the vaccines, antibi antibiotics, come from soils. Therefore, we have there a lot of potential. But if we don't manage well, this can turn in against us. And that's very important to keep in mind. What do we need to do? First thing we need to do is to raise awareness and, ad and advocate to include soils and soil biodiversity as nature-based solutions because they can help us. We need soil monitoring systems, including the whole soil, but we need to start really having soil biodiversity included as a key indicator of soil health. And for that, maybe we need to establish a global soil biodiversity observatory or monitoring system. Standard operating procedures to assess soil biodiversity at different scales. We need to have better knowledge about the microbiome. We need to have harmonization process in the knowledge about the different soil uh, biodiversity groups. We have to make efforts in strengthening capacities at all levels. We have to start moving into novel technologies, innovative approaches to study and use soil biodiversity. And of course, we need to target our research to address the problems that we are currently facing in all sectors. We believe that with this, we will be really gaining much because soil biodiversity has a lot to offer to us. Thank you, Ronald. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ronald. Um, and don't forget to send in your questions to him and also our next speaker, um, who will be speaking in Italian, Carlo Petrini. Um, uh, and now we've heard about the vital functions of soil, uh, that they include provision of food, fiber, wood, and other materials, uh, recycling nutrients essential to our ecosystems, hosting biodiversity, purifying water, preventing floods and droughts, and storing carbon. Well, Carlo Petrini has some other vital functions to add to that list. He's a journalist, author, and advocate for a sustainable food system. As you probably all know, he is president of the Slow Food Movement, which he founded in 1989. This grassroots organization has grown into a global movement involving millions of people in 160 countries. Speaking in Italian this morning, he's going to talk about the need to sustainably manage our soil to secure human well-being for today and tomorrow in the widest possible sense. And not just because more than 95% of our food comes directly or indirectly from the soil. Carlo Petrini, over to you. Io penso che in questo momento è molto that at this moment we have to recognize three principles this is a moment in when which we're moving to a different type of policy towards the soil so in this moment it's important to underline three points First of all, there's an invasive use of this word sustainable. Everyone's talking about sustainability. It's obvious that it's a value, it's an absolute value. But at this moment in time, I think we actually need to work on another word, another principle, regeneration. Regenerate means that we have an agriculture that regenerates, a regenerative agriculture it's fundamental because this is the passage this is the link which moves from an agriculture which is also always thought of the output and not of the participation of the sharing but now it's the moment to participate it's the moment to share and be responsible for soil and land 
Our mission has to be regenerating soil. That is the only mission which may attract young people back to the soil, back to agriculture. This is the first element. The second element, we have to recognize the importance of research. We have to strengthen the capacity of research to support this whole process. We need a research. At the same time, we have to underline another issue. It's uh, not only an issue of method, it's a substantial issue. If we have correct policies, they were often introduced by small producers. It's the small producers who have protected biodiversity. They have worked in person to reduce the impact of pesticides and all the products that are used. So our school of thought is that we have to give more importance to small undertakings and traditional knowledge. They are not against each other. There's dialogue because science needs to talk to the traditional knowledge. Otherwise, it takes the wrong track. If scientific research works with the tradition, they work with the small farmers who are guardians of the soil could change the whole model. The model, which has always privileged the agro-industry sector, which has privileged cement and the impoverishment of soil. This alliance between science and tradition is fundamental from this point of view. Third point, this battle is not only a battle for farmers. It's not only a battle for scientists who care about the defense of soil. This issue concerns everyone. Everyone must be involved. For this reason, in the next years, the work that we have to carry out is that of connecting producers with citizens, with people who live in the cities, because people through their, what they buy can influence what is being produced. Now, if this idea of sustainability is important to us, then we have to insist on one element. The actual policies must be recognized by citizens. What, pursued, what producers do must be known to citizens, and citizens can make their voice heard by supporting those who are protecting soil. That's why citizens become important. They become participants in society. They become people who understand the existing potential. If we don't exploit this situation, if we don't create this link between science, production, small producers, and citizens, then we have lost this battle for soil. We can't win this fight with only one element. We need to involve all actors. The earth is our mother. And as our mother, we have to act as brothers and sisters in the world. We have to remember the link that exists for too long. We have left the soil to speculative forces. It was considered only from a business perspective. It's time to stop. Soil must be considered as a vital element. It must be something which concerns us all. We have to identify with 
the soil because we need this best practice. And that's why I speak of regeneration. We can only regenerate the earth and soil working all together. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, very strong and, and uh, it really came across the message about the shared responsibility uh, to look after and to regenerate uh, our soil. Um, and interesting that we've all got to work together, farmers, scientists and citizens, um, to, to, and of course small producers as well. Um, uh, very interesting that. Now we, are, um, we, are, we do have time for your questions now. Um, if you've not sent them in already, please do uh, send them in via the little question mark uh, button on the bottom right hand side of your screen. Um, in the meantime, I, I have a question for uh, Ronald. Um, you were talking about how uh, soil biodiversity has been overlooked for so long. Uh, and uh, it's another one of these things that we have to do more research on. Um, do you think there's also, there's the political will and understanding? Uh, have we made the leap and do people really realize the importance of soil? Well, that, that has been always uh, some work that we are trying to do to raise awareness about the importance of soils because although currently there are more let's say um, attention to soils still is not enough because in 2012 11 we realized that well when people talk about soils especially when talking about agriculture and rural development it was everything about fertilizers so we had tried to change that and, uh, and make people understand that this goes beyond and as the previous speaker was saying yes soil is where everything starts so we need to really respect it. We need to really give it the value that it is. When I say that we need to focus on soil biodiversity now is because soil biodiversity has been a field that is more academic or is based on research. We need to move now from that and scale up actions because we, it has been demonstrated that it can help us a lot. Okay, thank you. And Carlo, coming to you, the thing about getting, um, a, a, as a, a Ronald just said, we've got this thing where the, the understanding about soil has been very scientific and not very uh, accessible for everybody to get involved. How can we stimulate citizens to get involved in something that up until now they've not really considered or thought about? I think that at this level, I think it's important to work on two levels. First of all, we have education, awareness. People don't know the land and schools need to provide information on the land. Schools need to play an active role to explain these aspects. Now, over these years, we have worked on implementing school uh, vegetable patches, vegetable grounds. Now having vegetable gardens in schools means transmitting knowledge to children, making them understand the importance of land and agricultural production. And this must be done at all levels of education. And obviously the second element is information. It's important for the in information to move forward. Media must play its role. We have to present useful information. We can't always talk about food from the point of view as a kitchen and as a show on cooking. We have to know that food is produced through farmer's work. Food also means safeguarding a heritage, protecting land. And we need to make an effort so that information is more inclusive of this aspect as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, vegetable plots in schools. And certainly, of course, under the pandemic, we've also seen more people thinking about where food is coming from, uh, and also trying to grow their own food as well. Um, so that could also be a help in spreading the message about the importance of soil. Um, okay, uh, we have a question from the audience. 
which says, following the withdrawal of the directive proposal on soil protection by the Commission, how um, should the EU act to promote, pro to promote soil protection? Um, I don't know, Ronald, maybe you would like to start with that? Well, yes, uh, I think the European Union is, uh, I mean, is the one of the, if not the only uh, regional uh, body with countries having common goals and trying to move forward many things. But when it comes to soil protection, I recall that there was one directive that was not endorsed and so. But looking, looking from, from the angle that we work here, uh, of course, in Europe, you currently, you have many initiatives at country level dealing with soils, but you also have many projects at the EU level dealing with soils. To me, I think uh, what, you, what is really uh, missing a bit is into really moving forward into uh, having a common approach for all that, because yes, at one level, you have regional initiatives, but then every country is doing so. Sometimes the connections are missing, and that's very important, especially in terms of mainstreaming soils to, to all these initiatives. And that's something that you really need to do. If compared with other regions, you are, you are doing quite a lot, but you need to integrate them in order to avoid duplication. Okay, thank you. Well, I think I'm going to leave it there. We can uh, come back a little bit more later, uh, but I'd like to now move on to our last two speakers. Uh, and then after that, there'll be more time for your questions. Now, when we're talking about soil health and biodiversity, farmers obviously have a very important role as we've heard also from Carlo Petrini. Uh, and we're now gonna hear a little bit more about it from the coal face as it were, or the soil face uh, with Alfred Grand. He's an organic farmer and a member of the board of the EU Mission on Soil Health and Food, which has recently published its report entitled Caring for Soil is Caring for Life. Soils are highly dynamic and fragile systems, and they are a finite resource. It can take up to a thousand years to produce one centimeter of soil for humans. But Alfred Grand, has a secret accomplice to cut that time down to six months. Well, actually, he has millions of them. And today he's going to explain why we should let earthworms do the job. Alfred Grand, please tell us more. Hello and welcome from Austria. I'm streaming now directly from our farm. And uh, why should I say let the earthworms do the job? Well, earthworms are the number one animals in the soil. They are soil health indicators. And I will tell you a little bit about how we work with them together. So soil health and biodiversity is strongly connected. As soon as we establish a healthy soil, we create a habitat for a diverse community of organisms. So soil is really the foundation of life and therefore also the foundation of biodiversity. I'm not only a farmer, as Aminda already explained, I'm also a member of the Mission Board for Soil Health and Food. And we found out together with the Joint Research Center that 60 to 70% of soils in Europe are not healthy. So our aim is, our goal is to have 75% of soils healthy again in 2030. So our chair, Keith Fermat, he came up with the title for our mission. It's called Caring for Soil is Caring for Life. And life is not only in regard to food production, to consumption and life for humans, but life is the whole planet. It's the whole diversity. It's the whole biodiversity of organisms. As farmers, we can do a lot. And I experienced that on my own farm. When we change to organic agriculture, we reduce the pressure on the land. So we, as an organic farmer, I stopped applicating pesticides. I stopped applicating mineral fertilizer, but we also reduce tillage. So what we create are healthy soils and uh, we regenerate the soil. So as Carlo Petrini mentioned, it's not enough to to stay sustainable, to stay, to sustain on the same level. No, we have to regenerate the soil. 
And as soon as we reduce the pressure on the land, we create a habitat for earthworms. So we keep the food, the, the, the debris of the plant debris, we keep them on the surface, for example, and then the earthworms can come up and then they fetch the food and, and they work the soil 24 seven. And, and they produce their vermicompost, the warm compost. And the warm compost is full of life. It's, it has uh, tens of thousands of different bacterial species of fungi, of protozoa, of nematodes. And all that creates a healthy soil. And as soon as we create a healthy soil, we will have healthy plants because these plants can control, they can cooperate with the soil microbes and they feed them even. Uh, and then the soil microbes, they mobilize nutrients for the plants. So the plants stay more healthy. They have a better immune system, which is really important for them. So if we create a diverse, healthy soil with a diverse life in the soil, we at the same time create uh, a healthy and a diverse uh, a range of organisms above the soil. So healthy plants uh, and diverse range of healthy plants provide us food and habitat for insects. And these insects are then later food for birds. So it all starts in the soil. And at Grand Farm, uh, in our farm, we realize that when we reduce the pressure on the land, we see that uh, birds are coming back, bats are coming back. Uh, so, so there is a lot of activity now in our farm. And that came, uh, that brought me to the decision to work with researchers together to create a more natural habitat on the farm. So I had the idea to create a research and, and uh, demonstration farm. First of all, just for research uh, purpose, but then I realized there is a lot of research result already there, but it's not implemented in practice. So I said, okay, research is not enough. We have to have a demonstration farm also. So what we are now doing is that we, we are working together with scientists, which have a different perspective than, than I have as a farmer. But when we work together, then we can uh, do much more and we can uh, create a healthy environment. And, and then we can show that to other farmers and we even can show it to citizens, on a, to consumers, for example. So when we apply regenerative methods, when we apply organic methods, when we apply agroecological methods to the soil, then our conservational methods, then we can really create a healthy soil. And I brought you some examples. Uh, I have a soil, I brought a soil with me, which I do not like, it's not healthy. And you can even maybe hear that this soil is like a brick. It's hard, so the water cannot infiltrate, the roots of the plants cannot go into, and then there is no life in this brick. But I also brought you another uh, soil, and this soil is full of life. As you can see, there are the roots and even earthworms are inside of them. And what I have seen, and I've brought you another one, another plant, and here you can also see that the roots are inside and you can see the, the crumbles, the soil aggregates, and, and they, they uh, keep, uh, so there is a lot of air space between the soil aggregates. So there, the microbes can move, the earthworms can move. And I also, what I also brought you is I brought some earthworms with me and I put them on the top of this plant so I can show you to you. But what happened now is that the earthworms, they went in into this soil. So I cannot show you anymore. But what I learned from it is they need a habitat. So they, they, they like the soil much, much more than my hand where I, can I could show it to you. But this is a good thing to learn. So earthworms need a habitat, they need food so they can work. And they even um, now in this second, they are already working again for a healthy habitat and for a bi biodiverse habitat. So it's not only working for me, it's not only working uh, for my farm, 
but it's work that it's done for a whole society and for the whole planet. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, what a shame we couldn't see the worms. Then again, I think perhaps at this time of the morning, it was probably better uh, that they went off and had their breakfast rather than ruining ours. Um, okay, thank you very much. It's actually fascinating to hear the, um, the, the symbiosis and the, and the close connection that you have with the scientific community. It certainly uh, is not um, very common everywhere. So that's a really um, interesting and powerful example for us to hear. Thank you. Um, now, before I introduce our final speaker, uh, just a reminder to send in your questions. Uh, we're going to be putting them at the end of to all of our speakers at the end of this last presentation, uh, which is going to look at how sustainable use of ecosystems can safeguard soil biodiversity. To talk to us about this, we have Carlos Guerra, who is a researcher at the German Center for Integrative Biodiversity Research and Martin Luther University Halle. As co-leader of so Soil Bon, he aims to create an international monitoring facility to survey soils across the globe. Indeed, he's been developing environmental and ecological models to describe and predict changes in terrestrial ecosystems, particularly in soils. Today, among other things, he's going to talk about the largest expandable soil data set for Europe. So, Carla Schwere, it's over to you. Thank you, Aminda. Um, so I'm going to try to uh, convey the message that uh, that all the previous uh, speakers already said, but I just wanted to make clear that we all understand that soils go way beyond agricultural systems and to have sustainable systems and sustainable ecosystems, we have to have soils uh, and soil biodiversity, so healthy soils and soil biodiversity all over uh, the world not only in farm systems, but also in forests and shrublands, in the top of the mountains and in the valleys. So to, to, to convey that message, or I hope that I can convey that message to you, uh, I'm just going to uh, underline some of the messages that my previous um, speakers uh, said. So first, soil is a rich uh, environment that contains many, many, many things. As Aminda initially said, a, a spoon of soil contains millions of um, organisms, but it's not only microorganisms, as Ronald was saying, it's also mesofauna and macrofauna. And there are gigantic earthworms, for example, in the Amazon, that are bigger than you and me. So we should soils in a very constructive way in order to understand exactly what we are speaking about. The other thing that was already mentioned, and I'll, again, I want to underline this, is that soils face, and biodiversity in general, faces lots of um, uh, uh, pressures at the moment, including climate change and including many of the pressures that uh, Ronald and the others uh, spoke. We also know about these pressures, but not from soils most of the times. We actually know about these pressures most of the times from um, uh, other systems, like in this case, uh, above ground systems. So if you see here, for example, the gray areas are what we don't know about uh, this, the, this type of organisms. And if you can look at the bottom part of it, where you see the soil related organisms, we don't know a lot. So most of our claims about how this system works and how, what are the threats to these systems come from above ground um, ecosystems. So, what to do? There was a question about how the European Commission could do something about it. One strategy is to place soils very strategically in what are uh, core policies, core EU policies. One of them is the Natura 2000, that is a conservation policy. And you might wonder, why am I talking about nature conservation if we are talking about soils? So the same way that you protect the the bald eagle or that you protect the Amazons, we should be able to protect soils. But the fact is that although we know that soils have all these um, ecosystem services that provide all these things that we can benefit from, not all mechanisms of nature conservation are currently available for soils. Would you protect an earthworm just because it's an earthworm and doesn't exist anywhere else? 
So in Germany, there's one that's like that. So it's in a local endemism. But there's no protected area to protect it because earthworms are seen as engineers of ecosystems to produce food most of the times. So not as, a, as an individual, a flagship species that we should protect. So the problem now that we face is to understand exactly how we can underpin the conservation of soils, not from a conservation uh, for production point of view, but the conservation for nature point of view, and how many of these things are available to us. In this respect, Europe is actually in a very, very good place because it, since 2009, uh, um, coupled with a program from Eurostat that's called Lucas, the, the GRCs of the Joint Research Center has been collecting about over 20,000 soil samples across Europe. And from those in 2018, we actually were able to collect soil, or we or them were, we, they were able to collect soils for biodiversity and functional analysis. So soil biodiversity and functional analysis. And for the first time, we will be probably be able to have an atlas of soils and soil biodiversity for Europe. But the issue is that although those data already allowed us to evaluate how things are, so how soils contribute to different cycles, in this case, it's the carbon cycles. And it, the good thing about this is that we also don't focus only on agriculture. We also look for grasslands, forests, and other systems. Although that is the fact, it's still incipient. So it's still in these first stages of assessment. We, what we need to a certain extent is to, and, and I cannot say this enough, we really need a system that is an holistic system that looks at soils for all that they are and for what, uh, all the places where they are. So we need a system that at the same time focuses on functions, so the things that we can benefit from, but also that ecosystems overall benefit from, and also focuses on the biodiversity side of this, but not only on the uh, potential biodiversity that will benefit us, like reducing pathogens, for example. We have to also focus on the things that we don't directly benefit from it, or we don't know yet that we benefit from. So protecting soils is a, a, a mission that we should look as protecting the unknown. As, as you know, we protect the Amazon, not because we know everything that is there, but because what we know that is there, we already see as important. And what we know that we don't know that is there is enough that we see the potential importance of it. So we have to look at soils in exactly the same way. Soils are a critical environment for our future. Uh, and this critical environment can uh, produce new medicine. This critical environment can produce new ways of uh, having better productions for, for croplands, for sure, but it can, it's also holds a very, very special kind of biodiversity. So the two messages that I would like you to take from this presentation is, the first one is we should move soil conservation as a concept beyond the farm system, beyond what we take as benefit to us. The second component of this as Ronald was mentioning in the beginning, and I would like to end with this, is that we really need to create a system that goes beyond borders. Europe already has a very good start of it. We should invest more on it. We should invest more on having this system really push, uh, having it pushed to the level that it deserves. But we are trying at the moment to create an international system that has the same purpose and the same message to monitor soils, from a holistic point of view, where all the aspects of soils are integrated into one single system that we can actually track what is happening to this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, very interesting. Uh, and we've already got some questions coming in, so I'm going to go straight to them. Um, uh, one says, the soil science and ecology seem still unheard, unneglected. How would you make a difference and give the soil the right attention as it should have? Uh, so, well, in a way, Carlos, you were already talking about that, but maybe you'd like to expand with a couple of sentences and Alfred too. Uh, Carlos, you first. 
So there are two ways that we can push this. One is to first create transparent systems to um, have this information and actually make it available. So one of the things is that SOL is not uh, poorly studied. But the issue is that it's studied in a very patchy way and we don't have the information with us. Most of the information is sitting in someone else's computer. So we have to push that information forward somehow. And the other thing is uh, we already have institutions that are doing the second part, less FAO, for example, that is creating a, a mechanism to, to transform that information into usable information to all of them, all of us, researchers, farmers, policymakers, and others that are and have an interest, yes. Alfred? I think we have to bring uh, science out of the universities. Uh, we have to incorporate it in the society. And the tools that we are using is the research and demonstration farms, what we also call lighthouse farms or living labs in our mission proposal to the European Commission for the mission soil health and food. So what we, we propose is that we want to have, want to see 1,000 to 2,000 living labs and lighthouses where cooperation between farmers, uh, between foresters, landscape managers, and the scientific community takes place. And then there is not only research and innovation taking place there, but we also want to distribute the knowledge. We want to communicate, we want to disseminate, and we want to demonstrate and en uh, make engagement with citizens and consumers. Uh, Ronald, um, from the point of view of FAO, um, what do you think about that? I think that might be quite interesting to hear your perspective. Yes. Um, well, look, um, definitely we need to take all this in board, on board, right? I mean, we want to get targeted research because in FAO we want to use uh, evidence-based information to support development to reach farmers and other land users, as Carlos clearly said. I mean, we have changed the approach of soils just for soil for food production. We are looking at the ecosystem services, right? But of course, farmers constitute a very important users and we need to work closely and support them because sometimes they are the ones facing the issues and we are doing research without considering that. And that's our main problem. And we want to guide targeted research so that we can help farmers because they are the ones dealing with all the challenges and problems. Interesting you talk about farmers, but of course, as we've also heard in this session, it's important to get everybody involved and not just keep it uh, on the farm because soil is important to us, not just because of food. Um, Carlo Petrini, um, how do you think that we can uh, make sure that soil has the right attention? You've talked about schools, uh, you've talked about vegetable plots. What about persuading policymakers and also people who fund research to be researching in soil? Beh, eh, innanzitutto, penso che sia. I think we need to be honest. We have to recognize that at a European level, in Brussels, we have a high presence of agro-industry lobbies. The huge producers are strong lobbies, but we don't hear the voice of the farmers. And if the farmers are present, then they are at a national level. They are not working together. They don't have a real impact. I've heard that there's research without farmers and it's true and it's absurd. We have to recognize the value of traditions and the knowledge that the farmers have acquired. Farmers ha need a dialogue with science but we need a science that recognizes the knowledge of a traditional farmers. And we need farmers that are willing to talk. If we do this, it, we're halfway. If we don't do this, we're going to miss our target. 
In fact, Alfred, um, just from the point of view of a farmer who's also working with science, I mean, what do the other farmers think about that? And, and are they interested? Do they want to follow suit? Um, it, what is the reaction and, and the dialogue between farm and science? Uh, when, when we explain our, the, the ideas of the mission of uh, soil health and food and we explain that we are looking for uh, other farmers to jump in and, be, uh, and, and work as a, together with science, then we realize that there is huge interest. It's, it's really fantastic. I just uh, yesterday I attended a workshop and, and I had some uh, talks to give there uh, from the EP Agri. And, and what they found out in a survey that uh, most of the farmers who already worked in a research project uh, called operational groups, uh, nine, more than 90% wanted to do another research project. project. Mm -hmm. So they are really interested. Not all farmers are interested, but there is a group of farmers who are really interested and they can act as a bridge to other farmers because the problem is often the communication. Uh, scientists and farmers don't speak the same language, even if they speak the same language. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I know. It, it, um, yeah, we all have our own terminology and jargon, and it's very difficult if people are not involved in that. Yeah. Um, we've got uh, two more questions, so uh, I want to uh, go to those quickly. Uh, one of them is, how could the common agricultural policy better support soil protection? Which available tools are there most effective according to the experts? And uh, we've got very short time. So anyone want to answer that in a quick sentence or two? A common agricultural policy? Yeah, the common agricultural policy is quite a difficult topic, uh, but we hope that with the mission board, we can, we can reopen it in a way and uh, also the uh, the European Union Commission with the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy, uh, we, we have to put more, more effort in, in bringing soil health uh, method, agroecological method, and so on into, into the gap. Okay, thank you. Yes, it was a big subject to open with three minutes to go. Um, I do have one last question, which I think is very important because it's something that a lot of people are thinking about. How can we innovate and continue with research without increasing prices for the final consumer? That's a tough one to answer. Anyone like to? Yes, go on, Carlos. You invest more in universities. Universities don't push the price up and you invest more in uh, channels. And actually the European Commission already does that a bit to push the research to directly to the producer. That's what you do. Okay, thank you, Alfred. Just quickly, uh, food has a value. And I think we have to raise awareness for that. And, and when we think about the, the, the last decades, the consumption, total consumption and, and the costs of food have decreased. And we have to bring the value of food back to people and raise awareness about that. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I'm afraid uh, we've now come to the end of the session. And on behalf of the uh, organizers, I'd like to thank our four excellent speakers for their contributions. We want to end this session with a forward looking message, giving information on the next steps to protect our soils and how you can be part of that. Here to tell us more is Mirko Barbero. He is leader of the soil team in the land use and management unit at DG Environment. You have a minute to explain how people can get involved. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Aminda. Indeed, uh, next year we will have a new soil strategy for the European Union. I'm happy to make this uh, announcement. All what we have heard today will be very, very important, very useful to, uh, to design it and to write it. But uh, everybody, all, all, uh, all you that you are listening, will also be soon able to contribute to, uh, to this. Uh, providing your ideas and opinion online on the europa.eu webpage. I will try to put uh, in the chat um, the hyperlinks. I hope they will work, yes, because you will have two opportunities. First, you will find the coming days on the Have Your Say webpage, a short document called Roadmap, just two pages describing what we intend to do for soil and how soil can contribute to the Green Deal. So you're you're welcome to give us uh, your feedback and inputs. 
it's really a matter of days when it will become uh, available. And second opportunity, up after about a month, you will be able to answer to a survey on what you know on soil and what you think you should be done for a healthy soil. So you will find a survey on the hyperlink. Uh, I see it's uh, now in the, in the chat. Uh, if you want to be informed when the roadmap and survey will be online, just write an email to the uh, address you also find there in Environment Soil and visit our uh, fresh new webpage for soil on uh, Europa. That's all from my side. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mirko. And uh, obviously, this gives you some uh, further work to develop um, what you've heard today. And so please do get involved. Uh, and I hope everyone who's been watching this uh, session has found the discussions stimulating and engaging. Um, and that you will get involved in those consultations. There is now a 15 minute break for you to grab a coffee, stretch your legs and give your brain a break before the next set of sessions start at 10.45. They include a discussion on the EU's contribution to achieving global biodiversity goals happening in the auditorium. And I'd like to conclude by thanking you, the audience, for your concentration and for your active involvement sending in so many questions. And with that, I now bring this session to a close.